And um, if we're going to talk about presidential elections, issues, and challenges, I think it makes sense to start off talking about uh, the primary elections. And um, so let's start off with this one. Um, you know, the primary election system um, is, is uh, a, a mixture of what the national political parties want to do and what the state political parties want to do. And so I guess my first question is just basically, is our primary election system broken, as some people have suggested, or does it still work OK? And I guess if it's broken, what, if anything, should we be doing about it? To, uh, well, thank you. And I will start. There's a couple of things I'd like to say first, though, is that uh, one of the things I just want to remind you of is that we are working very hard on having the first national youth forum and vote. And uh, we have uh, now over 2,400, I'm sorry, we have over 3,000 high schools, colleges, and middle schools signed up for it, representing about 3.2 million kids. We videotaped uh, eight of the 16 candidates. It will not be a debate, it will be a forum. The questions have been provided by the presidential classroom uh, kids, and uh, they'll have four questions to answer. After it, there'll be a vote for 36 hours and an exit poll, and uh, it's gonna be on the 14th of uh, January, right after the caucus in Iowa and probably the uh, New Hampshire uh, primary. So we, we, you know, we hope you're all involved in it, and uh, the, the reason we're doing it, and we're going down to the middle schools, is we think it's important that young people of all ages begin to be involved in this process. As you know, in Florida, we don't teach civics uh, till the second semester or first semester of eighth grade. And 40% of our adults cannot tell you our three branches of government. 73% of our fourth graders in a multiple choice test cannot pick the Constitution out as our leading legal document. We are, as a state, and unfortunately we're not all that, we're relatively illiterate. And uh, it, it's not anybody's fault. It's just happened over a period of years, but we've got to turn it back. And you know, your interest uh, in it and being here, and that really uh, gives us a lot of energy and drive to, to continue to, uh, to do this. So we, we, we truly thank you for, for your participation. And some of you have here have been, uh, I think it's the 11th one, isn't it, uh, Barbara? It's up there, yeah. Now, let me ask the question until we get it. I'll answer it. But why, why does anybody care about having an early primary? Why did Florida go ahead and have an early primary? I mean, what's the big deal? We used to do it in March. Why are we doing it in January? It's all about that. I hear someone over there. Why with common sense? Why would you want to be early in a primary? Get your words first. Um, yeah, we want more influence. Yeah, simple, very simple. What more influence? It's absolutely right. If the primary is contested and all the people come in and the campaigns of that, you get to know them, they get to know you as a state. We have a big issue in catastrophic insurance in Florida, which everybody's ignored up till now, but now that the primary is early, we are being heard. And when appointments come, whether it's the cabinet or the sub-cabinet or all these things, it's people from Florida who will have a better chance than somebody whose primary is going to be after February 5th because it's going to be over uh, on, on February 5th. So it's, it's power. There's nothing wrong with it. And of course, you know, when, when you look at the primaries in, in Iowa and New Hampshire, you can't find two states who are more unlike the rest of the country, and especially Florida, you know, unless you're literally white, you know, you're not going to vote because you're not there in those two states. It's crazy. Uh, why should they drive this primary process when they have nothing to really to do with it? The states are so small in electoral votes. It's retail politics, but it is not representative of our country. So um, to answer specifically the question, is it broke? Uh, yeah, it's cracked. It's not broke. Uh, no matter what you do, you're going to have a problem with it. I, I was heard one of the, the reporters say that they'd like the old convention system. Um, I personally wouldn't mind seeing a hybrid system that you can only elect 50% of your delegates before the convention, and then the rest of them are unpledged there, and so the convention becomes important. Who watches a convention now? I don't. It's, a, it's nothing but a bad variety show. Yeah, I mean, these guys and gals get on and it's all programmed and staged, there's no contest. It's ridiculous. I'd rather watch a soap opera. 
And I don't like soap operas. So put me down as an aside on this issue, okay? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, we can probably do a better job, but the, the biggest problem is getting people throughout this country to realize what the incredible 58 people who wrote the Constitution left us and what we have and the opportunities it presents us. It would be a shame uh, to let it slip away. Yes, it's broken. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's more than correct, it's, it's definitely broken. Um, I, I, I agree with, uh, with, with Lou. Um, the, the fact that basically Iowa and New Hampshire are the, are the gatekeepers of this process, the fact that most of the candidates that we'll be voting for, even if Florida has its own primary, will be out of contention, is nothing short of the scandal. I mean, in, in 2004, you look at the Democratic primary, which ba basically, after John Kerry won the, the, the New Hampshire primary, the Democratic race was over. I mean, Kerry picked up momentum, <coughs> the race was over. I was just looking the statistics up before I came here. I think something like 200 and, at most 250,000 people voted in the New Hampshire primary. So, I mean, what, what, what sort of system do we have where such a small minority of voters are given such undue influence. Um, Iowa, of course, is even worse because you're not talking about a primary. You're talking about people coming out on a Tuesday evening in January in Iowa. Which probably should disqualify them from voting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. You have to be really committed. Or you should be committed to, 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 to be doing that. Um, but, you know, the Iowa caucus. It's, it's, it's not even voting there, it's standing in the corner of a room for 30 minutes and politicking, that's all very interesting. But again, it, it gives an even smaller minority in Iowa and just influence. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm sympathetic to Florida and other states moving up. I think though the front loading will, will, will not be a fix, and I think that the system more fundamentally needs changing. Um, I think the way, um, I mean, this is nothing to, to do with structural rules, but the way the media covers primary elections. I mean, well, when was the last time we watched media coverage of primary elections and had a substantive and in-depth discussion of the issues? It's all horse race politics. It's all inside the, the ballot material. That's really not, I mean, you're a political junkie, yeah, it's interesting, but in terms of picking, you know, the leader of the free world, um, you know, it, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. What the fix is, I'm not sure. Um, there's, there's been, a, if you think back historically, there's been periods in American history where we had the same discussion, the presidential nomination system is broken, and we had different eras. You think back originally in the Congressional Caucus, then the nominating conventions, and the mixed system, and then after McGovern Fraser, the, the primary dominated system. You can make a case that every reform has actually caused more problems than the reform has um, the, 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 the implemented reform has tried to alleviate. So what, what the solution is, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a national primary. I mean, we're almost going to have a national primary. Um, the last count, I think we've got 21 states, 2021 20, states having primaries on, the, on February the 5th. So, I mean, the, this, the, the, we're, we're going to know on February the 5th who the two parties' nominees are and get ready for the, you know, a nine-month general election campaign. Again, that's great news if you're a political junkie and like the cut thrust of politics. But for the average voter, I think come um, um, you know election day in November, people are going to be uh, uh, tuned out. And um, I, I, I'll ignore Dr. Jewett's uh, dig, dig about the. I thought we were going to replay the Boston Tea Party. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm mad about the cat. Yeah, you did come back and run the yeah. cat in 1812. Well, I, I apologize for that. <laughs> I think Tony Close already apologized for that. I'm glad I'm having an apology too. Um, but it, it, it just seems to me such that the, the nominating system as it is now, it's, it, it, it's, it's like the Wild West. There's just no predictability. Here we are the week before Thanksgiving, and we still are not certain that New Hampshire is going to go on January the 8th. Um, that's what they're slated for because it's part of the state law that they will have the first primary week before anybody else. Michigan's moved up. We're not sure whether Michigan's going, um, going to hold its primary, I think, on the, the 15th or, or, or 22nd. Um, you know, this is just another of a way one should be electing a, uh, 
president. Uh, and, and I'll say one more thing. Um, does the primary process at all test any of the skills that are required to be president? I think it tests endurance. I think it tests the ability to give the same speech, you know, in small town after small town in New Hampshire and Iowa. But does it test the qualities that we look for in a uh, president? I mean, for a long time we, we've talked about how what it takes to be president is, is not what it takes to be elected president. Um, you know, I, I think the current system stresses your credentials as an outsider, your ability to raise money, your ability to package policy into 30 second sound bites, your ability to, 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 to give answers in these phony debates, you know, where you have these 30 second lightning rounds, where you're asked to explain your policy on immigration in 30 minutes. I don't know about you, it takes me, you know, 30 seconds rather, it takes me 30 seconds just to think what I'm going to say. You know, here's people being asked to uh, give, give, give their opinions on, on the really big important issues of the day. It's no way to elect uh, a president. It's broken. Yeah, let me just point out, though, uh, something that you uh, made, very good points you made, I was thinking about. It, it is interesting that it is an endurance contest, uh, but it is a contest, like when you go to a OCS, or if you do anything like that, it's a, usually a four or five month program, and part of the process of OCS is to find people who will break under pressure. Officer candidates. Well, officer, I'm sorry, officer candidate school. Uh, and, that, and that's part of the thing is to find people who break under pressure because the people who graduate will be in charge of certain people along the line. And here's my good friend Dick Batchelor. Dick and I do a lot of stuff in public radio. He's a wonderful guy. He's a former Marine and uh, he is also a member of the state legislature. And uh, we're lucky to have him here, so thank you, Dick. Um, but, uh, you know, Muskie, there was a guy named Muskie from Maine who was really well liked, and he went up to New Hampshire in the middle of the primary and they criticized his wife and he stopped crying. Muskie was history. Uh, Romney, Governor Romney in Michigan, went over to Vietnam, which was a big issue in the 70s, as you probably read. Uh, he came back and said he's brainwashed. Romney, gone. Uh, that would be Mitt Romney's father. For yeah, Mitt Romney's <laughs> father. Uh, and uh, we had incidents like uh, Dukakis, who they put in a tank and let him ride around, and it looked like Mickey Mouse, you know, riding around. The campaign was over. Uh, you had George Bush Sr., uh, who did two things. One, during a debate, he kept looking at his watch and, and that, and, and also he went through a checkout thing at Publix and got all excited because it was automated. I mean, where the hell has he been? Uh, <laughs> and I like him. I mean, but I mean, it's funny how you can, you can, these little things that happen, it totally blown out of, out of proportion. So in, in the one sense, the, the pressure you're under is nothing compared to be the pressure you're going to be under when you're the president and have decisions to make. And, and so in, in one sense, it is a marathon, but uh, it does weed out some who are uh, not able to handle pressure. Yeah. And uh, Dick, we're just finishing up the first uh, question I asked, which was, uh, is the primary election system broken? Uh, I say okay. a crack, he said broken. Yes, we've got one cracked, <laughs> one broken. If you'd like to weigh in on that, we'll, we'll, we'll throw it to you before we go to the next question. Uh, I'm very offended to refer to my friend, Congressman Fry, as crack. <laughs> that might become more obvious as he takes the positions later on today, we'll see. But uh, thank you for letting me be here. Uh, I'll make some observations. Uh, I apologize for being late, but uh, in my experience in politics, and some of you might relate to this, I came back from Vietnam in 1968. I had volunteered for the Marine Corps uh, during uh, the Vietnam War, which shows you automatically I'm not that smart. And, uh, but I got back, and unfortunately for us, we had the GI Bill, which entitled me to go to Valencia for two years, bless you, uh, two years free, uh, and also finish my two years at what was FTU. Your parents probably told you about it. It was FTU back then, and it's uh, been a long, uh, change. I mean, I would never have imagined, nor did anyone, I believe, including Charlie Gray and others who were there supporting the university, or live with you, that it would ever be this large of a university and uh, this prestigious, uh, I think, of course, the bell curve moved when I graduated, uh, finally. And uh, I uh, said to a group of 300 high school students recently, I thank God that I uh, finished school before FCAT, otherwise I'd see what Evans High School and shot making bird houses, and you can only sell so many bird houses. So, um, but I, I finished up here, and uh, but my involvement in politics was when I got back from Vietnam and got involved in campus politics. I started seven young uh, Democrat clubs from here in uh, Valencia and Silicon College and Rollins, etc. 
and got exposed early on to politics and uh, really enjoyed it a lot and thought that would be something I might want to do as a career if I ever finished my college degree. Fortunately, by the time I finished uh, the university here, I was interviewed by, speaking of old names, Vice President Hubert Humphrey, if you recall, was uh, LBJ's Vice President, and he was running for President in 1972, along with Muskie and George McGovern um, and others, and uh, I supported his campaign and was an advanced person on the presidential campaign, uh, which was my first job. I mean, they offered me $12,000 in a car expenses, uh, borrowed some money and bought two blazers, and, uh, and I thought I had arrived, I mean, because no one made $1,000 a, a, uh, a month back then, so I had my orientation to politics, and I liked it. Now, fast forward, though, when I, uh, actually not fast forward, staying to there, for a moment. Fortunately, uh, luck has a lot to do with it, Lou. Um, they always say, be careful who you step on, on the way up, you might have to come back that way, and it's no more real than it is in politics because you're never on top always, as Republicans have learned, so you have to be careful how you tread. But in meeting, uh, the point I want to make here in politics, and we can say one of you other questions, though, to encourage young people to get involved, which Lou has done a tremendous job of doing, is that I used to think that I just, well, maybe I'll go work for one of these candidates because we had the senators come and the House members come and we had, at the time, Senator Ruben S. who went on to become a two-term governor, a presidential candidate. We had this crazy senator from Lakeland who was going to walk from Century, Florida, all the way down to Key West and campaign, Walter Malton Childs, who I thought he was crazy, went on to become a two-term governor, uh, 18-year United States senator. So you just never know in politics, you know, what... Uh, you know, what's going to happen? You really do not. I mean, it's so early on, we can talk later about the primaries and the caucus and what is that, uh, is it a precursor to anything that really happens? But I would encourage you to get involved. My last note is that having all these candidates come speak, I started inviting members uh, of who, or excuse me, candidates for the legislature and the county commission and the school board, and that's what I recognized and it had nothing to do with pride. But looking at some of these candidates, I said, oh my God, I could be one of them. <laughs> So don't ever underestimate yourself in your preparation for public office because, frankly, oftentimes you meet candidates and you quickly figure out, I can do that. So I would encourage you to stay involved, and I appreciate you being here today, and then I'll, I'll catch up on the other questions, and thank you. All right. All right, well, um, actually, let me do one quick follow-up on this primary thing. If it's, if it's cracked or broken, um, how is it possible to fix it? Because, uh, you know, Lou, you were in Congress and served in Congress. Is, is this something that Congress could actually do? Or is this something that's going to be fixed that the parties themselves would have to do? Because the parties, the Supreme Court has often ruled that the political parties are private associations, private groups, and thus Congress and other governments are somewhat limited in what they can tell them to I, do. I think so. it's up to the, to the states. I think you'd have a real constitutional issue if, the, uh, if they did it otherwise. And we've talked about regional primaries, which might make some sense and so forth. I, I think you, you've seen it now. Uh, Bill Nelson, uh, Nick, is suing because of all the delegates for the Democrats have been taken away by the National Party. And thank you. I really <laughs> thank you for that. that could, I mean, Republicans are pretty dumb, but that's, that sort of <laughs> matches what we can do. You only took half your Yeah, yeah. 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 we were only half but we took half away. But no, I think, I, I think it is worth working at, and uh, it, there's got to be a way, I think, a little better. I'll tell you what also is under this, and Dick and I have talked about this a lot, is money. Uh, I don't care what kind of system you have, I think money is corrupting our political system, especially the soft money. Hard money is what you give to a member, you can, not a corporation, it has to be a person, it's a limited amount of money, it's reported. Soft money, you can write a check for any amount for anything, and they're not, quote, political organizations, but that's a lie. That they're political organizations. I think it's corrupting, in it, and, and I don't think you can fix just the primary system without trying to fix the money system. Okay, they have a Jacob Paul said, you can tell I've been in politics because he asked one question and asked a totally different question. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm still good at that. I, I learned from Hillary. <laughs> 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 Afraid it's dead. We'll talk about Thompson later. Um, but um, all the primary and uh, in, uh, in the caucus part of the, part of the process, too, uh, I think Howard Dean, the chairman of the Democratic Party, is what I told you earlier so was taking himself hostage and threatening if anyone tries to rescue him, he'll shoot the hostage. 
when you don't see delegates from the state of Florida, which has been the pivotal state in the last two presidential elections, one of which the Democrat has won, um, and you don't sit, seek the delegates from the state as influential as Michigan, the whole Democratic convention will now be resolved, revolve around the debate where we've taken ourselves hostage and refused to seek very strong delegates. It makes no sense at all. I would suggest don't try to compromise before the convention because otherwise the whole uh, focus will be on uh, the delight of Blue Friday's Republican colleagues and how the Democrats have, uh, have the circular firing in the squad. So, but the only make one final point too, and that is if you look at the caucus state, we'll talk about who's doing how and which state and what differences it make. If you look at uh, Iowa, you know, it's interesting that you would have so many people in the candidates going back to Iowa, going back to Iowa, going back to Iowa, and so many bells of hay can you sit on? And if you look at the demographic makeup of Iowa compared to California or New York or Florida, I would suggest to you that Florida's melting pot is more reflective of the whole total makeup of the United States than the state of Iowa. In fact, I think they have three blacks in Iowa, two of them snow ski in New Hampshire, which gives New Hampshire four blacks. In other words, I'm being facetious, but the fact is, how can you run for president in a caucus state like Iowa and comment on all these issues that are so important outside of Iowa and let Iowa almost dictate what's going to happen? Then you go to New Hampshire. So the Super Tuesday uh, will be a very instrumental. In fact, I would suggest, we do not discuss this, by, by Valentine's Day, uh, some won't be getting Valentine's card, but the presidential election will be over. The nominating process will be over by no later than February the 14th because of the way you put in loaded some of them. But the fact is, the way we currently have it, and of course, Iowa has the opportunity to keep moving. They can move it to maybe the next couple of weeks we could open the caucus in Iowa. But it's really a, dis a disproportionate representation of the process. We'll talk later, I'm sure, when the question is, so what does it mean to be nominated in, in uh, uh, when the caucus in Iowa, if you ask the last uh, Ten nominees, not much. But we'll talk about that. No, no Republican has won the nomination unless they won either Iowa or uh, New Hampshire, which is crazy. So the Democrats, I think, have been oh, quite right that. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think any Democrat who's won the Iowa caucus has won the presidential nomination. So I think we're just on the other side. We have less hate than the Republicans, I suppose. So, so. <laughs> on, on the question of is it going to take an act of Congress to change this system. It probably is. I mean, New Hampshire's state constitution says we will go first. And if you leave it to the parties, you're going to have a situation you have now where everybody's going to be moving up. New Hampshire's going to move up because of that. And you know, the way things are going, New Hampshire's going to be voting in you know, June or July, of the, the year before a presidential um, election. Um, I mean, the, the, there's, there's another question, though, here is, you know, is, is front-loading necessarily a bad thing? I mean, the fact that we'll know the identity of the, the Democratic and Republican Party's nominees probably on February the 5th, or at least maybe a week later, that may not be, be a bad thing to, to, to have a nine-month general election. You, you, you have a period then when the issues can be debated. The voters uh, are exposed to, to the candidates. I mean, just to give a comparison, um, um, in, in, in Britain, a lot of people, after at the end of the general election campaign, say, oh, I'm sick of politicians, sick of the election campaign. That's a four-week campaign. And I say, come to the United States. That's, 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 that's nothing. But, um, so yeah, on the one hand, um, you know, there may be voter uh, fatigue, but, you know, whoever the nominees are, to, to, to be out there for, for nine months now, having to uh, defend yourself, having, having to talk about the issues that matter, um, may, maybe that's good for democracy. Uh, more I admit, it, 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 it may bore the, um, uh, the the average voter, but I, 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 I think that's that's a different problem, the type of structural problem that um, we're uh, talking about. I have to sort of say as well, I mean, I think front loading is, is going to front loading is going to mean you're going to have more viable candidates around than ever before. But okay, you know, it's going to be over after February. Uh, the fifth, but the fact you've got 20 states voting that consists of about 60% of the population means that more people than ever are going to probably have a meaningful say in picking both parties' uh, nominees. Um, so, so again, when we talk about is, is the system broken, I think we have to figure out what it is that's broken, first of all. It's all too easy to just throw around words like broken or cr 
cracked with actually saying what what is it that we dislike about the present system? Um, you know, every system has got its advantages and disadvantages. And I'm not totally convinced that the we're at the point where the disadvantages so outweigh the advantages that we need to change to something else. And again, the something else, as I said a moment ago, may end up producing more problems uh, than the existing system. And you know, in ten years' time, we look back and say, "Oh, remember the good old days of uh, unloading?" Uh, you know, you, you, you're just not sure what you're going to get when you reform, and that's true. So, so, about so much of the American government, reform has unintended consequences. In England, they spent less than three hundred billion dollars in the entire campaign. How much? What was the uh, 300? Yeah, in, let's see, in Canada it was 34 million, I think, for uh, the total campaign. And in the United States, a billion dollars. A million. And, and that, I mean, the difference in the time and the money and so forth. And I'm high in England, I think it was 100 and something. I know the Canadian number was low, but uh, that's one of the blessings of having a, a short campaign, and it goes back to the money issue. Obviously, it's an interesting issue, and uh, but the trouble is, once we get through the election, we'll think it's Thanksgiving, and we'll ignore it again for another two or three years. It comes on us, and then we'll go through this debate again. <laughs> this, is, this is not the first time I've sat on the. All right, we've taken all your. All right, well, let's move on and uh, move on from. Um, uh, well, we'll still talk about primaries, but rather than talking about the primary system itself, let's look at the Republican side and the Democratic side. And the, people that are trying to become the nominee for the Republicans and for the Democrats. Let's take Republicans first and sort of handicap the race. Uh, we've got Rudy Giuliani, who's ahead in the national polls uh, by about 10 points, but has been made clear by a couple of speakers already this morning. It is a state-by-state -state race. Um, so Giuliani's ahead uh, overall, but uh, interestingly, uh, you have somebody, Mitt Romney, who's ahead in three of those first states, Iowa, New Hampshire, and uh, looks like South Carolina is uh, in first or close to it. So I guess my, uh, my question is, let's talk about these uh, the candidates uh, on the Republican side and sort of weigh their strengths and weaknesses uh, for uh, winning the nomination, but also for being president of the United States. Uh, and Lucas and Purdue Republicans first, but you want to start that one? Yeah, I'll so uh, first, how about that? But the interesting thing you want to watch in, in Iowa is Huckabee. He's now moved up to second in the poll uh, in Iowa. Uh, he is uh, in, liked by the, uh, the uh, more conservative side of the Republican Party. He is Romney's biggest problem, uh, because Romney's put everything, all his chips, in trying to do well in Iowa. I think he's been living there and so forth. Uh, and if Huckabee continues to move up as he does, he's going to take it from Romney. Uh, Romney cannot afford uh, to lose in Iowa. If he does, I think in his history, I personally think Huckabee is going to be the vice presidential nom nominee. Um, I, I know the the other three relatively well. Fred Thompson was on a committee way back in the Watergate, and I worked with him in the Baker campaign. Um, uh, he has been endorsed by uh, the Right to Life group, uh, which could be a help in the ones, but I don't think, to me, he doesn't have the fire in his belly you need to be president. I think his bride does, but uh, I don't think uh, he really wants it that much. He didn't run announced early because of the rerun money. Uh, there's some called the equal time provision, and if you uh, if, if you're a candidate for president or national office and you're on television, uh, as he was on that show, the reruns of it, they'd have to let every other candidate get on. So he had a choice of either collecting money or uh, run for president, and he waited to collect all the reruns. Nothing wrong with that, but again, uh, that, it sort of said to me, gee, you know, I don't want to ran for Congress. I want, I knocked on 30,000 doors. I wanted to be in the Congress. It was, that was a burning desire to do it. And I, I just don't particularly see that. I think he'll do it right. I don't see him as the long one. McCain, who I have personally known, my roommate was shot down on August 22nd, 65, and uh, was in prison with McCain. And McCain was stationed at NAS Jacks when he got out, and I had a chance to meet him. I really like and admire John McCain. Uh, I think he is. Uh, a, a true American hero, and uh, I think part of his problem is A, he misused the money, not, mis not misused it, but it was wasted the money he raised. I secondly, he got away from what, who he was and that, and I think he's gotten back to it, but it may be too late. Uh, the question is, is can he win New Hampshire? He won't win Iowa. 
if he wins New Hampshire, he could be a viable candidate. If not, he's through. Uh, Rudy Giuliani has sort of taken the position that, look, those early states aren't as important as the other ones coming up, including Florida, South Carolina, and the big states and all. This is the first time we will see if you can basically, as a Republican, ignore the two early states and still capitalize on what your polls say nationally. Uh, I don't know the answer to that because it's never been done before. If it was me, I'd roll the dice that way. I would concentrate on the, on the bigger states because I think a lot of us are just getting tired of Iowa and New Hampshire and retail politics and, and that, and it's, it, I think it's out of the way. So if I was putting, objectively, putting money on it uh, right now, uh, I would probably say Giuliani is the favorite. Uh, McCain can be a spoiler. Uh, Romney has a chance to be a spoiler. I think Romney would be a tougher candidate for Giuliani than McCain, but, but if he doesn't survive, I think Thompson, uh, despite second place in some polls, but doesn't have the money and is lagging behind. And if that doesn't work, uh, we're going to nominate the mayor, present mayor of New York City. Okay. And Jonathan, uh, we'll just sort of go straight down the table. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not going to agree with what Lou said. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about this race is Giuliani can probably lose Iowa. I think people who will lose Iowa to Romney can probably lose New Hampshire. He'll definitely lose Michigan because Romney's father was governor there. You got local connections. Um, but because of front loading, because of Giuliani's name recognition and fundraising advantage, I, th I think Giuliani can survive that. I don't think a candidate could survive three or four losses in, in another presidential election primary season, but this is a different presidential election primary season. So I think Giuliani's put up enough of a firewall to avoid those early pr primary losses. It, it would be amazing if nobody has ever won both, I think on either side, the, the Republican, on the, uh, certainly on the Republican side, the New Hampshire primary and the Iowa caucus and not be the Republican nominee. So if Romney went on to win Iowa and New Hampshire, he'd be flying against a lot of history. Um, but as I say, I think because of the way it's front-loaded, it uh, definitely could happen. I also wouldn't write off McCain. I, I think McCain could very well be um, to the Republicans what John Kerry was to the Democrats in, in 2004, which... <laughs> he's a take, 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 take that out, by the way. But I, I, I mean, in terms of his... Um, I mean, four years ago, people were writing off Carrie Kate. Carrie was basically dead. He mortgaged his house, Teresa's house, I guess, <laughs> on, on, um, to, 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 to put more money in, into Iowa and New Hampshire. Um, and we all know what happened. Carrie came back from the dead and was, was, you know, became the party's nominee. Um, you know, back in September, most Republicans were writing off McCain. Uh, maybe McCain can resuscitate his campaign because of the and question marks over the, the, the other candidates. Giuliani's too socially liberal. I mean, we're talking about a guy who's pro-choice, pro-gay pro rights, has been, you know, seen in drag on several occasions. Not the sort of candidate who usually resonates in, in, in a Republican primary. Sounds like a Democrat. <laughs> <Yeah. Well>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Could, 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 well, I mean, he did endorse um, the, the Cuomo, didn't he, back in the 94? Um, you know, there's still neighboring questions about, um, you know, are the Republicans going to nominate a Mormon from Massachusetts? I'm, I'm, I'm still not certain about that. 36% of voters say Romney's religion is a factor against voting for him. So I, I think that could be a problem. Huckabee, I agree, probably could be a, uh, a, a vice presidential nominee. Um, you know, whether we want another person from Hope, Arkansas, um, you know, we, 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 we can debate that. Um, so who does that leave? I think Thompson's singing, singing with without a trace. Um, so you know, McCain might just be the most acceptable last person um, standing. Remember as well, in, in Iowa, it's not a simple, straightforward vote. Um, I, it'd be very interesting to, to, to see where the second preferences in, in that Republican caucus um, uh, kind of go. I, I, I think McCain's out of um, uh, Iowa. So, so, so the, the, the question is who's going to finish second in, in Iowa? If Giuliani does, I think he's strong in New Hampshire. If he doesn't, 
Iowa becomes, uh, New Hampshire becomes a must, a must win state, just as it did, was for George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988. 1988, uh, Bush the Elder came third in Iowa, and then he had to defeat Bob Dole in uh, New Hampshire. It's very ancient history for, um, I don't know, we're talking about 1988. But uh, then, then, then I think Giuliani probably has to either, either win New Hampshire or come probably second in uh, uh, New Hampshire. But you know, the, the way things are going, Gi Giuliani's first primary win could very well be down here in Florida, uh, which of course his wife was moved up largely to help uh, 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 Giuliani. So it's, 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 it's a different primary nominating season. Conventional wisdom says you, you lose the first three or four, you, you won't get the nomination. I think Giuliani can defy expectations. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I don't, I did not as a Democrat bring up the fact that uh, Rudy Giuliani has been seen in drag a couple of times, including on Saturday Night Live. Maybe he's actually wants to be Queen of England. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a whole other issue. I'm not going to involve in that at all. But uh, let me say, uh, Governor Huckabee is really interesting. He is from Hope, Arkansas, which is where. Bill Clinton came from, and maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing for, for him, but he's interesting because he's finally beginning to, to get some traction and a little money, but the guy who intrigues me in fundraising is uh, Ron Paul. I mean, he raised $4 million on the internet, which is really funny because that's how Howard, Howard, Howard Dean uh, got traction in the campaign he ran for president by going to the internet and raising money, so Ron Paul you know, could be somewhat of a spoiler. I don't know what his numbers might be in Iowa, but he... Uh, has some appeal to a, a lot of people, and he's raising money. Uh, I think uh, somebody told me Fred Thompson when that was in the race, and I had not noticed. Um, I think I think he had waited the last minute and figured, well, I'm with all this you know, notoriety. I've been a senator, and I'm on TV, and I'll throw my hat in the ring, and people are begging me to get in. And then it was like he announced it was like applauding with one hand. I mean, everybody's like, so where's Fred? And my response, Fred is dead. And I don't think he responded. Uh, has any traction at all. I just don't, I just think it's kind of good old boy, kind of, you know, I'm trying to be Ronald Reagan with the Southern accent, just as itself, because Ronald Reagan is much different than, uh, than Fred Thompson is on, on politics and everything else. It's interesting that Fred Thompson did get the endorsement, though, the pro life uh, group, as uh, Lou pointed out, uh, which is very interesting because I want to use that to segue into my favorite candidate, Rudy Giuliani. As was pointed out, he's pro-choice, pro-gun control, pro-gay uh, marriage. He's had three affairs to imagine, and maybe he should run as a Democrat. But my advice would be him and three wives. He should just become a Mormon between now and the general election. He won't be explained those, and uh, he can get on with, uh, with the business. But also, there are two other things, and several other things, and uh, I think he's a great target for the Democrats because he has a lobbying uh, firm, and uh, he's uh, uh, according with the Texas that represents Venezuela oil. Our friend Hugo Chavez. Also, his former police commissioner was just indicted under federal, several federal charges. He was involved in the grand jury depositions on that. He said he did not know that his police uh, chief was having his house remodeled by someone who had a contract worth several millions of dollars with the city of New York, by the way, was also related to the mafia. So, the point I'm making here is it's nine tenths of New York. Yeah, nine tenths of New York, right. But he, if you have to respond to those kind of questions, campaign, people get really sidetracked very, very quick. If you don't have a focus, you almost a mantra, go back to the same issue. Now let me talk about, very quickly about Senator McCain. I think his bus is back out of the ditch. It certainly was in the ditch for a while, but he's back out of the ditch. And I think if you look at it, I'm not a Republican, so I can't make this judgment, but uh, if I was, I think what I would say is, look, by the time you get ready to vote, which, which is the adult on the stage? By that I mean, which person up here has extraordinary experience. Well, he is a hero. McCain is a hero. Uh, and he has been a great United States senator. Has he taken some votes that are antithetical to the conservative wing of the Republican Party? Yes. Or torture was one. But he had the credibility to take that position because he himself was tortured for five years in, in the Hanoi Hilton in, uh, in uh, Hanoi. So, I mean, I think he has that credibility. Romney, and I, this is just a kind of visceral response. He's a little bit too young by half, maybe. And I think his biggest mistake is when he asked about support of the war in Iraq and why none of his boys had volunteered. He says, well, they're serving the country by staying here and working on my campaign. 
Now, I'm sure every mom and dad with someone in Iraq or in Afghanistan can agree with that. I don't, I don't think so at all. So I, I don't, I don't know. He, he'll, he'll drop a lot of money. He's extraordinarily wealthy. He can drop money in it. Uh, but in, in the end, I think McCain uh, resurfaces. Keep in mind, if McCain was destroyed in South Carolina by George Bush, uh, Bush 43, by basically race baiting and saying that uh, the rumor was that McCain had a black child out of wedlock, but he has a black child. The child was adopted. But that was kind of the lead up of politics that killed him. But now he's reached out to the really conservative wing of the party and some of the Christian right to help in his campaign, but then he just got better as a final note. Jerry Falwell, uh, excuse me, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell. Uh, Pat Robertson, as you know, has endorsed Rudy Giuliani with the record that he has on these kind of issues, social issues. What's going on there? Uh, if I recall correctly, Pat Robertson was the one that said we were attacked on 9-11 because of a whole bunch of homosexuality. We were being punished, one. And two, if you recall, and probably the younger recall, when Mayor Cook was mayor, she agreed to put up the gay pride flags downtown Orlando and that year we had massive fire, forest fires, primarily in Volusia County on the interstate. Pat Robertson said that was God responding to the gay flags. He has also been sidekicks with and close friends with the former Liberian dictator, Charles Taylor, who's now in an international uh, tribunal being tried for crimes against mankind. He also built a net network, a TV network, as a nonprofit and sold it to 400, for $400 million to Rupert Murdoch. I mean, who is this guy? I mean, I mean, how can you, my final point is this, I think it's an insult to the people who are pro-life, suggest they're willing to set aside those strong convictions to give Giuliani a free pass uh, on this nomination. I think he, I, don't, I just don't see him coming out of the uh, convention. He might, if he's got the money, he's trying to push the uh, security thing, I can hear, I'm here to defend you. But by the way, it's a final, final vote. So you said that there's a third final vote. <laughs>
what happens with independence in New Hampshire, which in turn could affect who ends up winning the uh, New Hampshire. So I think that that's something else to kind of Why keep, keep, keep in mind. A little more about the voting thing that they did, because we registered here different than maybe Well, Fl Fl Florida is a closed primary state, which, which, which means that in independent, tough luck, you, you can't participate in, um, in either Democratic or Republican primary. Some states like New Hampshire have an open primary whereby independents can choose to participate in either the Democratic or the Republican primary. You can't participate in both, you have to choose which one. And historically, independents in New Hampshire have gone into the primary that looks like it's in more flux. Uh, and I think the Repu Republican race probably is more dynamic now. In fact, in many ways, the Republican race is looking more like an old-fashioned Democratic race, where it's nobly a front-runner, and if you, if you've got candidates slicing the vote four or five uh, uh, ways, uh, it looked like the Democrats were going to be like Republicans, they were going to end up among Hillary, but uh, yeah. I guess we'll get to the next question. Yeah, so, and that is, I was going to say, what you said as a segue, nice segue, into the next nice segue to the next question, is let's, let's take a look at the Democratic side and handicap the race. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, like Rudy Giuliani had in most national polls, really all national polls, um, unlike Giuliani, she's got a larger lead, and unlike Giuliani, she's also ahead in most of the individual state polls. So I guess we can handicap the race, but also just uh, as an added uh, mixture of uh, addressing, you know, is it even possible for Obama or Edwards to uh, to catch her at this point? And Dick, we'll start with you. Yeah, my first disclosure is I did Bill Clinton's first fundraiser in 1991, 13 months before the election, and begged one, uh, 85 people to give me $100 to have breakfast with the governor of Arkansas just to see what he looked like. There was no one but he win. And keep in mind, everybody was so attended in that race. Uh, Basically, they stayed out of that race. Of course, he went on to win. And they were extraordinarily generous to me with appointments to UNESCO and other things. So I'm, a, I'm biased, and I'll disclose that up front. Uh, I'm shocked. Hillary, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, actually, I spent my 10th anniversary in the White House, and I stayed one more night. I could have been the Secretary of State, maybe. But anyway, um, um, I, think the, uh, I think that Hillary's going to, she can't be stopped. You know, Barack Obama obviously is a very, very appealing candidate, but, and he raises a lot of money, and he has a great appeal for lots of reasons. But I just think, and I've said this for, since he's been in the race, when you're in the United States Senate for less than two years, or around two years, that does not qualify you to be the President of the United States. In fact, if you look at the tradition, and I'm already could be more precise on this, most people really select former governors former chief executives of states to be the president. So, uh, and that's pretty clear over the last 50 years. But while I think Barack Obama is very attractive, he cannot make up the difference. In fact, if you look at the polling, uh, the, uh, African American females are just reportedly share, uh, supporting Hillary over Barack Obama. So it's not coming down just on females, but for Hillary, you know, blacks are voting for Barack. It's not that at all, you see, uh, which I think shows just a big sophistication and maturity and growth in the whole whole process. So I don't think uh, we'll do well. Like Chris Dodd is not going to uh, move up any place, even though he's moved his family out to uh, I was seeing uh, Ted Kennedy's uh, uh, favorite uh, bachelor a friend uh, hanging out on a, a Bella Pay and I, just doesn't <laughs> doesn't match up with my trying to the image of uh, Chris Dodd. Uh, I don't think he'll. Uh, get any traction uh, at all, and I just don't see. Joe Biden, by the way, I, I would say that he would probably be a very serious contender as a running mate. He's uh, been the chairman for a wrong the Senate Judiciary Committee, been chairman of the Armed Service of the Foreign uh, Relations Committee. He's a very, very astute guy. He made a, he ran for president, made a mistake himself, speaking of mistakes that could disqualify you. This quote an Irish, uh, actually plagiarized an Irish poet, and that's what got him thrown out of the race, which is very uh, interesting. Now, Ted Kennedy, I could see uh, this quote in Irish, but, but that would be after a couple of years, probably. But, um, but I just don't see, uh, I think Biden could be a very serious contender. Now, my dream ticket is, now this is where you wake up and, you know, not going to happen, but my dream ticket is he gets the nomination and at the convention announces that a running mate is Colin Powell. Because I think the race would be over. You've got a former uh, uh, George H. Chap, former uh, Secretary of State, um, African American. I mean, it would be like a female presidential candidate and African American Vice President for the first time in 200 plus years. So 
you know, that would be very, very hard uh, to run against. Very difficult. I don't think he will do it. He had some. He, he had the strength, I think, to run four years ago, but uh, because of his wife and some of the issues that she uh, struggles with, I think he decided to stay out of, out of the race. He did not want to pick his wife to that. But that would be my my ticket if I could have a dream ticket. But I think Biden could be a very strong uh, running mate, and uh, even though he's also from uh, New England. Uh, but I still think it could be a good running mate. Uh, John? Senator Clinton is uh, still a front runner. Um, this this su supposed stumble she's had in the campaign, I, I was waiting for this to happen. The, the media basically anointed uh, Hillary as the, as the nominee back in August, September. Of course, it's not in the media's interest to have a coronation. It's in the media's interest to have a, a competition. So I was just waiting for the moment when either Edwards or uh, Barack Obama would, would be, you know, become the anti-Hillary uh, anti uh, 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 candidate. Um, structurally, I, I think Hillary still has a tremendous advantage. Um, if, if you look at any Democratic um, nomination contest, it's usually boiled down to the establishment candidate and an insurgent candidate. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can go back to, 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 to 68, you know, Eugene McGarvey as, 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 the, as the insurgent candidate. And in every election, you think about Gary Hart, Paul Songers, uh, we, we go on and on and on. There's always a Democratic insurgent, kind of like an, an idealist. Every time the idealist loses, uh, the Democratic establishment goes to its establishment candidate, and clearly Hillary Clinton is that establishment um, candidate. So Hillary is definitely a front runner. Either Obama or Edwards is going to emerge as the principal rival. I strongly su suspect that's going to be Obama, simply because Edwards, he's been around the block before. He's ran for the presidency. He's the VP candidate. Uh, he's, he's not new. He's not fresh. Um, I think Obama does have that rock star Bobby Kennedy type quality. And I, 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 I agree with Lou that you know to, to, to base a campaign on simply depending on a youth turnout is probably is probably not a sound strategy. That's what Howard Dean did. Um, and, and it didn't materialize. Um, just anecdotally, and I picked this up from uh, the kids in my classroom, Obama's different. He, he, he generates something out of the, uh, it's difficult to quantify, it's difficult to say what it is. Um, but should Barack Obama win Iowa, um, I think it's a real race. It's a real race because Hillary's entire campaign has revolved around uh, a sense of inevitability. She's going to be the, the nominee to get on board. Um, if she loses uh, Iowa, that cloak of inevitability uh, slips away. I think Hillary will, 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 will be in a, in a tremendous race. And as we saw in the debate a couple of weeks ago, um, when Hillary's under pressure, uh, you know, will, will, will she be able? You know, will, will she be able to put up with with that pressure? I think Hillary Clinton's had a pretty easy ride so far. She was challenged in that debate by Tim Russert, um, and uh, you know, kind of the old Hillary kind of manifested itself again. So if she is in, in a one-on-one -on -one race with Barack Obama, I think it could, could be very interesting. That's why it's, we haven't had up to now. We have, we have these six or seven-person debates, and um, you know, your voices get. Get, get lost in, 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 in all that traffic. I think it's Hillary against Barack Obama, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and, and there are some debates uh, after uh, the New Hampshire primary. Um, I think Obama could have an advantage, and, and I'll say one more thing. I think the Republicans want Hillary to be the nominee. I, I, th I think with, with, with all the deficiencies that the Republican candidates bring to the table, Hillary's the one person that unites the Republican Party. That's why Pat Robertson's endorsing Giuliani, because he thinks Hillary Clinton is you know, the devil in the car. My enemy's enemy is, is my friend. Um, and, so, and so Hillary brings that. The, 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 the one thing that brings to the, the, the table, um, you know, Hillary Clinton unites the Republican Party. I think Barack Obama would be a much more difficult candidate for the Republican Party to defeat, simply because he would activate a huge minority turnout, I think, Young people's turnout would go through, 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 through the roof, um, and he'd be a much more difficult candidate to um, uh, defeat. Uh, I have to say, I'm always cautious about handicapping the Democratic race. About this time, four years ago, I gave a radio interview.
you were at, uh, I can't see any situation where Howard Dean wouldn't be the party's nominee. That rain has since been carried and... <laughs> Actually, I think I have the opportunity to rehabilitate myself here. So I'm, I'm always, always very cautious in making predictions about Democratic primary uh, campaigns. So, kind of summarise, yeah, Hillary right now is, 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 is the front runner, but I think that the race is a lot more fluid uh, than it was a month ago. Let me get back to a different way because I think we do covered it pretty much. Let me look at it from a congressional standpoint. Uh, it's rather interesting that. A lot of my friends who are Democrats, especially those who are in Republican districts in the sense that they voted for Bush in either 00 or 04, there's 61 districts like that in the country, are praying Hillary doesn't get the nomination. Uh, they'd much rather see Obama or Edwards get the nomination. And the reason is pretty simple. Uh, Hillary is very popular. People that like her really like her. People that don't like her really don't like her, and the, her, neg her negatives are as high, or, or actually think they're higher than anybody I have seen running in either party for a, num a number of years. I mean, she, she truly has incredibly high negatives. What does that mean for a congressional candidate? Well, uh, we had something called Watergate that happened in 73. President Nixon resigned in 74. I was in the Republican leadership. Uh, Jerry Ford against some of our advice, and he was right, we weren't. Uh, pardon President Nixon to get this country moving on. It was one of those courageous acts, because we thought it was going to cost him the presidency. It did. And in every district, the Democrats did not run against me or whoever the Republican House member was. They ran against Nixon and Ford. And all the, the morphs started at that point, you know, where the candidate's sitting there, and the next thing you know, it's somebody else's face on it. I remember Newt Gingrich and that kind of thing going on. And, and they just, we lost 70 seats. The country hasn't recovered from that yet in a lot of ways. Lopsided government in either party is not good. And uh, what people are worried about in those 61 seats is that the House literally could be a lot closer than it would be if Edwards or Obama is the candidate. Now, what difference is that going to make? I don't know whether it's going to make much difference. I don't know if anybody particularly wants to oppose Hillary. But I know a lot of people are saying, boy, you know, I hope something happens because I'd much rather be elected than have Hillary elected. And I mean, and I understand that. I mean, you know, it's, it's survival that you're talking about. So that, that's a really interesting, interesting issue. I don't know if it'll make much difference in the campaign. I think when I look at the Democrat side, I'm trying to figure out who's the vice presidential nominee going to be. Uh, you look at the Midwest, which is always key, or the Sun Belt. Uh, can Joe Richardson, who's Hispanic, a heck of a nice guy, a friend of mine for a long time, you know, can he do it? Can Biden, who's a senator from Indiana, do it? I don't think it will be Obama. I'll tell you what I would be doing if I was Obama. I would do the same thing that Ronald Reagan did. Uh, I would uh, not take the vice presidential nomination. I probably wouldn't be offered it anyway, but I wouldn't take it. And what I'd do is I'd go out and I'd say the right things. Ronald Reagan made only two speeches for Jerry Ford in the campaign. That's all. Gave him lip service and prayed that Ford would lose and Carter would be president. Hmm. Why? So he, could win. so he could win. If Ford was president, and that Reagan would never have had a chance. And from Obama's standpoint, he's run a good race. He's a young fella. Uh, very articulate, got a lot of bounce to him. Uh, I don't think has the maturity that he will have four years from now or so forth down the line, but he would be the front runner. So, you know, when you look at these things and that, and you, you've been through some of these campaigns and that, it, it's sort of interesting because on the surface, you know, everybody should love everybody and work this thing, but it, it, it's like a, a symphony with point and counterpoint. You've got a lot of things going one way, and then you got the things underneath the surface. So. You might want to watch some of these trends as, as they go along. One last thing. Edwards can afford to do, say, anything he wants about Hillary and beat her up and do anything he wants because he's dead meat. If he doesn't win this time, he's over, so it doesn't make any difference. Obama can't. Obama has got to work within certain parameters. And he may take a few shots at her, but he cannot cross that line because Obama has a future in politics, and he doesn't want to dissipate it in this race. Can I interject a couple of things here? We'll start off by agreeing with Lou. I, I agree that Noah's brought that up. And, uh, 
uh, Dr. Sutherland jokingly said there already is a vice president. Hillary is the nominee of that with the bill. But, uh, so maybe there's not room for another vice president. Uh, give him he some. wouldn't take second place. I no. think he wouldn't. But I think uh, the point's well taken that uh, Edwards will, you know, there's no phrase to be a lobby. You just kind of roll a grenade and tend somebody will come out and talk to you. But that's John Edwards' approach. Now he's just rolling uh, the, Get ready to attend, hoping that something will happen. It's a hell Mary pass, but and he can take the risk because he won't be in the administration. If Hillary happens to get the nomination and win, Barack Obama, on the other hand, I agree, can either continue to be a United States Senator and look at a cabinet decision from which he could run for office or stand the U.S. Senate as the leader of the Democrats and uh, tee himself up for four or eight years down the road, depending on how things go. And he's so young, he's got that opportunity to do that. I want to go back to uh, the issues because if we all, and I would agree on this, when it comes down to it, the question is going to be, whoever the Republicans nominate, will the conservative base dislike that person more than they hate Hillary? That's what's going to occur. They're going to get swift voted. Hillary's going to get swift voted left and right. It ain't going to be pretty, but it hasn't been pretty for a very long time anyway. But what I think, one of the factors is, when I ran in 1972 at 24 years old for the legislature, I want to tell you my single most qualifying characteristic. You were against? I was never in public office. That was the Nixon years. Yeah. And, and if you look at the race for the legislature in 74 and 76, a lot of 20-somethings got elected because they had never served. And the qualification was, you haven't been in government? Good, you're not tainted yet. We'll give you a shot at it. And that gets back to the Bush administration. We're talking about polls, he's the lowest of any president, I think, in the 32. Of course, the Congress is like about 24, so they're... That, that's up from a lot of... Yeah, they're, but they're both competing for last place. But here's the point. People just don't like what's happening. That is Hillary's strength. Because the Republican nominee has got to, to some degree, support the Bush years. But how tepid can you be very. And, and they were very, very tepid because you've got to support some of the Bush administration's initiatives, including the war. You've got to take position. And I think the mindset of the voters, which is influenced by the circumstances beyond the candidacy of anybody, is that I just don't like it. Just, you know, get rid of all of them, let's start over. And this country is pretty darn well divided, too. So it would be interesting to see. So I think the perception or the mindset of the voters might be a, a more presidential PREC on determining the nominee than the nominee themselves. Because I think those issues resonate very deeply with people right now. And it's going to be very hard for Republicans to say, I've got the nomination, and let me, let me just thank George Bush for four years of tremendous service. Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult for them. I have to say as well that the, the, the maybe a little bit of a backlash against these um, political dynasties that are emerging after having, uh, you know, George W. Bush, son of the former president, is the country going to go for a, the, the wife of a former president? I mean, getting back to your original comments, I thought this is why this country had a revolution in the first place, to get rid of political dynasties, dynasties and, you know, the, kind of in, in, in inheriting something because of who you are, not about your uh, aptitude for politics. So I think if Obama can, can, can make if, if, if he can make that claim that he is the genuine change candidate, and Hillary Clinton is part of the past, and you know he, he's going to be a candidate who genuinely can bring a polarized nation um, together, I, I think that's one of his pluses. Um, as I say, in, in a change election, I, I think it's plausible um, to say Hillary is the change candidate. She, 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 just by definition, by virtue of being a United States senator and in the White House for three years, she, she, she obviously isn't the change candidate. All right, and uh, I was asked um, by the director of the Pride Institute to end this program just a little early, so I was going to ask one or two more questions, but instead, uh, since we have about seven or eight minutes left, let me open it up to audience questions. I was wondering, everyone talks about Huckabee as being a vice presidential nominee, but why not presidential? Uh, I think I can answer that because he doesn't have enough money for exposure, and I don't think he's going to get that big a boost out of it, uh, but uh, he has come on probably, he is of all the candidates in both parties, he's probably made the most progress and uh, you know, it could be, I mean he could go and all of a sudden win in Iowa and New Hampshire you, you, you got a different race one last thing, we're talking about the, the 
people and thinking about it. Let me just throw out a number to you. In, in Florida, in the 06 primary race to nominate our governor and our senator, effectively 5.1% of the people in the state voted. Let me uh, interject uh, one thing, too, on uh, the choice. Uh, governor Huckabee should be the natural, natural choice of the conservative wing of the Republican Party, in particular the pro-life group. They, they endorsed Fred Thompson, even though when he left the Senate, he was paid to lobby for a pro-choice group. And then you've got, as I mentioned earlier, Pat Robertson embracing Giuliani, notwithstanding the fact of all this pro-choice, and the, it, to me it's just very bizarre. Dick, do you think they endorsed them to, to, to give, uh, you know, to take some away from Huckabee in case he was a, uh, maybe they want Giuliani, maybe this is a way of messing everything up. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, listen, I, I, would, I would think so, but again, if you look at the, uh, the, just the issue of the choice issue, I mean, uh, the, the choice group has made a, has made a disservice to Huckabee uh, to because he would be the natural, the natural choice. Uh, again, I make one more point because it's, to me, just bizarre. It's only way I can explain Pat Robertson um, to endorse. Uh, I think he loses tremendous credibility. Whether or not he cares or not, I don't know. But I just think a strong, wherever you are on the issue of choice, you have to respect the convictions of those who are pro-life for their reasons. Uh, and they are so invested, emotionally invested in that issue. It is their issue, the number one issue. And again, I think it's patronizing for Pat Robertson and Julian to suggest somehow someone who's pro-life is going to say, okay, I couldn't be a pro-life in support of this candidate, give him a pass and everything. And I just don't see that happening. I, I tell you, I have not taken a position publicly yet because of this institute and everything we're doing. Uh, it's pretty simple for me. Uh, what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm, going to look, I'm going to look at the candidates and I'm going to pick whoever I think can be her. And I think there are a great many Republicans I know who are, who are approaching it that way. I think she'd be a disaster and if the House and Senate are Democrat, they'd set this country back just years and years and years, both economically, military, and politically. You put me down as neutral on Hillary, though. I was. So you look at this country back many, many years. You're talking about the last four years in the Bush administration? Yeah, the last eight years. So, 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 he probably struggles in the in the purple states, um, Pennsylvania, Ohio. You're talking about Huckabee. Um, talking about Huckabee. He carries a Republican base. That's 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 the one side point of Giuliani. He's competitive, maybe even in New York. Maybe he forces Democrats to, to defend um, uh, California. Uh, he, he expands from, from 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 the red and blue state map. He expands the, the from beyond the red states. Huckabee doesn't, doesn't do that, and I think Huckabee would have a tough time even holding the states that George W. Bush won in 2004. I think many of the western states are in play. Uh, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado. I think Giuliani resonates the Huck, Huckabee, I think we would lose those states, plus the traditional swing states like Ohio and Pennsylvania. And I think Romney too, excuse me, Robert, but I think Romney too, through keep in mind when he ran for a, a governor of Massachusetts, he was pro-choice, but now he's pro-life. And again, I think people who are involved in that issue are very suspect when you go, it's one thing to uh, you know, kind of moderate your position, but when you do a 180, you think it raises a, a lot of suspicions about where is your conviction today. And I said about Giuliani, if you don't like the position he's taking today, wait till tomorrow. Congressman Fry, um, you've been in Congress, so you might be able to answer this. You said the approval rate of Congress is at 24%. Yeah. Uh, do you think that will end up actually hurting candidates like Hillary Clinton that are very prominent in the Senate? And then uh, just kind of another question. How far do you think Ron McCain would be able to use his American hero image to his advantage? First thing is I don't think it will hurt that much. It's interesting that the approval rate of Congress has never been too much. Uh, they may dislike the Congress 70 or 80 percent, but they like their congressperson. And that's been true for years and years and years. It's very hard to nationalize a congressional race. Newt did, did it, for instance. He was able to. So a lot of the congressional races, especially in the House, are more an individual thing. So I don't think it necessarily will have any uh, any impact uh, on that. And the other one was on uh, John McCain. How, how much did he use his uh, image here? 
he, well, he is a hero. Uh, and I don't think he tries to use that image. I, I think he's been very good about that kind of thing, because I don't think it really gets you particularly anywhere. But it, it certainly, when you look at his ability to stand up to stress and pressure, to probably understand the international implications of a lot of things. I mean, we're, we're looking at Pakistan right now. And you know, the, that, the Taliban take over in Pakistan with nuclear weapons and means of delivering it. Um, I think whoever in either party is would want somebody who can stand up to that kind of pressure or maybe has a background and experience. So I think that's probably one of his strongest assets. I also think that one of his strongest assets was the fact that he sort of shoots, he doesn't need anybody to prep him on what to say. He says it. I think he lost for a while that and spent a lot of time saying things and going to things he didn't write. And Dick talks about Pat Robertson and so forth. One of my closest friends, Susan, who was a Marine, Pete McCloskey, if you remember, because he lied about being in, the, in, in Korea and everything, and, and won the suit. I don't think Pat Robertson, you know, because he says something, everybody's going to jump up and fall in line. I think that, that that's true for a lot of people who characterize themselves as leaders, and uh, I'm not so sure that there's they can influence as many people as maybe they could in the old days where somebody said something and jump up and do it. I don't think it works that way anymore. Maybe because it's the internet, maybe because it's 24 hours of news, seven days a week, I don't know, but I think people like that have less clout. I mean, foreign policy is, is going to be front and center of the general election campaign, and I, I think that's going to be one of the primary qualifications. When, 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 when the general electorate, I'm not talking about the primary electorate now, but when the nominees are known, we start thinking about the general election. I think that's going to be the, the front and center of everyone's criteria. Who is the strongest candidate on national security, uh, foreign policy? Uh, I don't think anyone can um, touch John McCain within the Republican Party on, 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 on those credentials, on his, his foreign policy credentials. To be honest, I don't think anyone in the Democratic Party, with the exception maybe of uh, 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 Biden, but uh, I don't think Biden's going to be the uh, uh, nominee. If I was a Republican, um, I'm not a Republican, but I think John McCain would, would be the most electable um, candidate.